Well, welcome back to our next week, our next lesson in uh, how to live the Christian life uh, the Puritan way. And uh, we're continuing to preach or t- excuse me, teach through uh, different lessons. And actually, this week is about preaching. And uh, once again, we're, we're leaning heavily on Leland Ryken's wonderful, wonderful book, uh, Worldly Saints, the Puritans as They Really Were. And uh, you might be asking, okay, well, what really does preaching have to do with the Christian life? Well, actually, how the Puritans viewed it, it had everything to do with the Christian life. It wasn't merely just a 30-minute uh, lesson or speech that we would listen to on Sundays and then we get back to our normal life. No, rather, preaching is one of the most central things to the Christian life. And as we're going to see, hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that and show you that one of the things as Christians that we should look forward to most is the sermon. John Preston, the Puritan, says, There is not a sermon which is heard, but it sets us nearer heaven or hell. I think that is really stunning. There's not a sermon in which which they hear, that we hear today, that does not set us nearer to heaven or hell. So let me ask you this, how much do you look forward to the Sunday sermon? What does preaching mean to you? How how high up on your priority list in the Christian life would the Sunday sermon be? Leland Ryken opens his chapter with this story. He says, to set the stage for my remarks about Puritan preaching, I invite you to accompany me to England near the turn of the 16th century. Lawrence Chatterton, first master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, is preaching in his native Lancashire. His nor- this northern shire is Catholic territory. People do not often hear good sermons. Chatterton has preached already at this point for two hours. Imagine that. It's a two-hour sermon. He's about to conclude and says something to the effect of that he would no longer trespass upon their patience. Wow, I'm sure that when we get up to about the 40-minute mark, that's probably something we need to say too. Then he says this, but the audience, this is is wild, listen to this, but the audience will not allow the preacher to stop. They say, for God's sake, sir, go on, go on, they urge him. At this point, they're saying, Mr. Chatterton was surprised into a longer discourse beyond his expectation and satisfaction of their importunity. Leland Reichen then says this, this incident is noteworthy, not because it was rare, but because it was common during the Puritan movement. Here's what's so stunning about this. And, you, and if you read about the Puritans and, and you, you read about those who were influenced by the Puritans who, see, who sought to preach and he'd be influenced in their preaching like the Puritans, you find many of these stories where they would preach and people would say, no, 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 keep going. Why is that? Were they just phenomenal speakers? Well, sure, some of them were. They were very good, natural speakers. They said of John Bunyan that he was a, he was a great preacher and, and he, was, he was probably a great natural speaker, but it was more than that. It was more because they were face-to-face with God in the preaching, and the Christian needs the preaching of the Word because it's in the preaching in the sermon where everything else stops, and we are reminded of who we are and who it is that is the lover of our souls. So what I want us to do is just, is just look at a couple of things, and eventually, actually, what I want to get down into is what makes a good sermon. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I'm never going to preach Um, what in the world, why should I even keep listening to this? Here's why. Because what we need most today, and I'm not saying this lightly, what our church and and therefore what our country and world needs most is good preaching. We need to have a high standard of preaching. Our, Our standard of preaching right now is so low, and there's no wonder why the church has caved in in many ways in different areas. We need as Christians for our faith to grow, for us to be more Christ-like. We need to understand what preaching is, and we need to understand what makes a good and edifying sermon to us. So first of all, I want to do is we'll look at the primacy of preaching. Why is is preaching 
uh, supposed to be high up on our priority list. Well, the Puritans, they, they viewed preaching as the pastor's biggest responsibility. And I wonder, is that what we think? That whenever we look at a typical pastor and we think, here are his hours in the week, what is at the top? Well, the Puritans were unanimous saying that the preaching was always at the top. You know, we, we typically can think, even just in worship service, we can, we can typically think that, that music is most important. Well, here's what J.I. Packer says. J.I. Packer says this, both minister and congregation should recognize that their Sunday sermons are the most important and significant events of the week. Whatever else is neglected, sermons must not be neglected. That, that, is, a, that is a stunning, stunning uh, quote there from J.I. Packer. Jeff Packer is saying it's not merely the most important thing in, in the worship service. Not saying that other things like music are just uh, the bottom tier. No, no, no. We're not saying that at all. Music is crucial. We, we need, we, we must have music in our worship. But there is something that is most important. And it's hearing God's word preached to us. J.I. Packer says this is the most important and significant event of the week. Now, I wonder if we think that during the fall, well, maybe not this fall, because who knows what's going to happen with college football, but in a typical fall, what is the most important thing to us in the week? You see, here's why I think J.I. Packer is saying this, is that on any given Sunday, or, or, or even for youth ministry, or for young adult ministry, on any given Wednesday night, this might be someone's last straw. Someone might be sitting there, and they're on their last straw. They might be thinking, I'm going to give Christianity one more shot, and then I'm out forever. They might, so someone is sitting in the pew who is severely at the moment being attacked by Satan, and they have no clue how they're going to withstand. Someone is, is so desperate to grow, so, so desperate to see Christ, that that's all they want for that 30, 35 minutes. Someone this, someone else can be sitting in the pew, and they're going to be dying that week. If you have one chance, one chance to hear one last sermon before you died, what would you want it to be like? You see, that's why preaching was, it, it, there, there was a primacy to it. And, and the preaching, uh, the, the, the Puritans knew that preaching, it, it, it had to be held in high esteem. And that's often why may, maybe sometimes you can see people that even right before they go up to the pulpit that, the, the, the preacher, he seems just very uh, solemn, serious, almost even nervous, and not necessarily nervous because he's going to have to stand up and speak in public, but more so because the sermon is weighty. It was, it's, it's really, for the preacher, the sermon should be all-consuming because you are standing in, before God to speak his words, not our own, to you. Secondly, what we need to see is, is the impact of preaching. The, the Puritans said that the sermon, it was a moment. Uh, not a moment for the preacher. Not a moment for the man in the pulpit. No, no, no. It was a moment for preacher and people before God himself. And that, and that regardless of whether someone is preaching or whether someone is listening, for both parties, it's always a moment. Even, even this Sunday morning, whether you are listening to it via, via Zoom or whether you are there in person, that sermon, it is a monumental moment because God is speaking to you through his word. Richard Baxter, the Puritan, he says this, It is no small matter to stand up in the face of a congregation and to deliver a message of salvation or damnation as from the living God in the name of our Redeemer. It is not an easy matter to speak so plain that the ignorant may understand us, and yet so seriously that the deadest hearts may feel us, and so convincingly that contradicting cavaliers or, or those who doubt may be silenced. That is a, that is a wild, uh, that, that's almost a quote that I, I need to just have above my computer or, or, or at the, on my door at the office of saying, this is the goal. How popular were and impactful were uh, Puritan sermons? Well, they were hugely popular, hugely popular. They, they would actually preach 
uh, anywhere from three to five sermons per week. And that's, that's not just saying, well, they had the early service and the late service and the evening service and then the Wednesday night. I mean, no, no, no. People were like, they were wanting to listen to them. They would preach in their church. They would go out into the community and preach. They would go and guest preach. They were looking for opportunities to preach because they realized what the sermon is. John Cotton, or someone says about John Cotton's preaching, says this. This, this, is, this is wild. Listen to this. Mr. Cotton preaches with such authority, demonstration, and life that, I think, when he preaches out of any prophet and apostle, I don't hear him. I hear the very prophet or apostle. Yea, I hear the Lord Jesus Christ speaking in my heart. That, that is the impact of preaching. That's how the Puritans saw it. And that's the way we need to view preaching. And maybe we've been there in those circumstances where we are sitting and yet we hear the audible voice of a physical man in front of us, but yet those words have such heavenly weight to them. Almost as if at times you feel like you're almost being like pressed through the floor. You just think this is so incredible. Everything else seems to go away because you're just so enamored by what is being proclaimed. There's also something very important to preaching what made it impactful to the Puritans and what should make it impactful to us is there is an intellect to preaching. In the face of much biblical illiteracy during their times, the Puritans sought actually not to dumb things down, but actually to raise up to have much higher standards for their theological education. And I think that's actually really important because we are looking at the same days today. That there is much, even though there's a, there's, I mean, I probably have 12 Bibles in here, and that is far more than, than so many people in the history of the church ever have. And, it, and it, there's just, there are Bibles on our phones, there's, there's Bibles on all these apps, it, it's, it's everywhere. And yet, we're so biblically illiterate today. And yet, what we should, what we should um, prioritize like the Puritans is not to dumb things down, but to raise our theological standards. The Puritans thought that, they thought that knowing what the Bible said and how to apply the Bible was the most important thing about ministry. It wasn't, can we make sure that we have good organization or can we make sure we have good programming or can we make sure we have you know, good small groups or whatever those things, all those things, they're, they're important. We should seek for good leadership, organization, communication, administration, all these things. They are glorifying to God, but there is one thing that is most important. And it is knowing what the Bible says and knowing how to apply the Bible. That is the highest standard for the minister. And we need to ask ourselves, why is this, why is theology why is it kind of downplay today? Why is, you know, so almost, it's almost sometimes you feel like you can be dissed because someone can be saying to you, well, you're just such a theologian. Well, actually, you see, theology is like the rudder of a boat. Is that the boat goes where the rudder steers it. And so it, that's what our theology is to our life, that our theology steers where we go. We would be foolish to think that it doesn't matter. You see. The way that you respond to the death of someone or racial um, uh, uh, hurt and pain or um, battling against temptation or extreme suffering that is happening to you, your theology that is applying to life is going to determine how you respond. And that's why the Puritans, they knew that theology was most important in our lives. And so they sought to preach high intellect sermons. Now, does that mean that they preached in ways that only the really smart people could understand? Actually, not at all. They preached so clearly, so simply, and yet not dumbing it down so that no matter who came in, no matter how smart they were, they could be blown away at how rich the theology was. And yet at the same time, an elementary age child could sit there and listen and take it in. That, that is what we should be aiming for. 
You see, this is actually one of the reasons why the PCA, our own denomination, has such high standards uh, for theological education, because the pastor is the local theologian of the church. Um, that, that's why seminaries are, are vital, and that is in many ways. The church goes where the seminaries go. That's why we need to have high standards of, of, of intellect, of the preacher's learning, and of continued learning, and, and even need to support and encourage our seminaries. You see, it's so vital to the Christian life that we understand the primacy of preaching, the impact of preaching, and the intellect of preaching. We need to understand these things because when we do, the sermon is all of a sudden the moment where we realize this is monumental. It's monumental for everything that is going on in my heart right now. But now that we kind of understand a little bit of what we could call the, the presuppositions of preaching, what, what about the actual sermon? What makes a sermon a good sermon? Uh, what were the Puritan sermons like? What, what, they, they really tried to think. And they really almost, um, the way we understand preaching today is based on their understanding of preaching. And so what I want us to do is actually kind of mark, walk, walk through just a couple of, of, of things that made Puritan sermons worth listening to and what will make our sermons worth listening to. Here's the first thing. The first thing is this, is that um, the, the Puritans would preach expository sermons. Maybe you've heard that word. Maybe you've heard about expository preaching or expositional preaching, what in the world do those terms mean? Well, essentially what it means is this, is that if we're going to have an expository sermon series, what we mean is that maybe what we'll do is we will go through the, the, the book of Galatians from start to finish. That we'll go through Galatians and we'll preach through it verse by verse, not literally one verse at a time, but we won't miss a verse. And we will let the Bible say what the Bible wants to say. Now, to give you another example of kind of a, uh, a different type of expository preaching, what we did with the youth ministry back in the spring is that we preached the Upper Room Discourse. We preached John chapter 13 all the way through John chapter 17, preaching verse by verse to let, the, to let God say what God wants to say. That is, that is what expository preaching is. It is... It is wanting God to say to us what he wants to say to us. It's not us making up what we want to hear. But rather, it's letting God set the agenda. Here's what the Puritan William Ames says. He says, this is what actually some preachers do when they don't want anything to do with expository preaching. Ministers impose upon their hearers and altogether forget themselves when they propound a certain text in the beginning as the start of the sermon, and then go on to speak many things about or simply by occasion of the text, but for the most part, draw nothing out of the text itself. Okay, it's a little bit of a wordy quote. What does he mean? Here's what he means. Have you ever heard maybe a preacher or a sermon where they'll read the text and then they go on to preach about nothing about what the text is about? The text that they read at the beginning is just a launch point for them to say whatever they want to say. Good preaching is not whenever the preacher is up there wanting to say merely his opinions. Good preaching is actually whenever the preacher tries to get out of the way of God's words. The preacher, really even more so this, it is when the preacher himself is so absorbed with what God is saying that he is seeking to speak to the people what God is saying to apply it to the people. You see, the, the goal of expository preaching is to let the text say what the text says to the people in front of you. In other words, one of the things that they have often taught us in seminary is that we not, not only want to, um, we not only want to know what God's word says, but we want to know what God's people are like. In other words, what John Stott calls it, he calls it between two worlds, where there's the world of the Bible that we really, we must understand, and yet there's also the world of our people right now. And the preacher should seek to not only understand God's word, but he should seek to understand us. Like I, I, need, a, I need a preacher who, who, 
understands God's word in me so that he can take God's word and almost walk across that bridge and bring it to me where I am right now. That's what good preaching does. You, know, you might ask, okay, well, why does Pear Orchard, why do we do, we, we, do, we definitely do some topical ser- sermon series, and that's not wrong. Um, we're doing one right now. And matter of fact, tonight I'll be preaching one on uh, the idols of the heart on race and culture. Uh, topical sermon series aren't, aren't wrong, but what should be the main diet? The main diet should be expository preaching. And one of the reasons why at Pear Orchard, why, why we seek to do me- mostly expository preaching series is because of this, we know that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Um, we know also that, that God knows what will happen in the future and that whatever text that we are on that week, it's going to be the right text. I, I remember a couple weeks ago, actually, when, when all the things in Minneapolis were happen, happening, and uh, I remember for the youth we were going through our uh, various psalms for large group this summer, and that was our uh, expository series of just going through various psalms. And, and the, the psalm that was going to happen next, when everything seemed to be more chaotic, was Psalm 8. And how appropriate was that? Psalm 8 is this psalm about the, the glory of God in the majesty of man. It is just, it's a high doctrine of man. And it was such a perfect text. Not, not a perfect sermon, but it was such a perfect text for us in that time because we were reminded of who we are in the image of God. That's what God does. I, I'm sure you've been through these situations where you thought, wow, that was a perfectly timed text for everything that was going on. And you know what? That was planned like months and months and months ago because we said, hey, we're going to preach through the book of Genesis. We're going to preach through the book of John, the book of Galatians, or whatever it is. You see, the Puritan, the Puritan sermons... They were also, sorry, I turned my fan on. It's a little bit, little bit hot in here. Um, the Puritan sermons, they were also, they were organized. They were not random. Um, Jonathan Edwards once said something along the lines of, what does it matter if you preach to people for so long and yet they have no clue what you just said? It's as if almost you're preaching just to deaf ears. The Puritans understood this. They weren't just kind of like, rambling on in the pulpit and just saying theological stuff after theological stuff. They worked hard on the structure of the sermon, and so should we. We should seek to work hard on the structure so that it's clear, so that it's simple, so that it's logical, so that we're not boring, that we actually like to care for you. We should seek to help you to listen. And in many ways, the pastor is teaching the people how to listen to the sermon. That's why we should, that's why sometimes three points is really helpful because it helps you to know where you're going. And also it helps you to know how to follow what God's word is saying. You know, it's almost kind of like this, that the, the, someone said of Jonathan Edwards sermons is that it was as if he was going to war in each sermon. And what he would do is that he would carefully organize his canons in, in a row. And as he would begin to preach in the, in the intro and in the first point and the second point, he would just align those canons in their proper order. And then in his last point, which was the application, he would fire the canons. That is, a, in a lot of ways, what we need to seek to do in preaching. Is that the organization of the sermon so that we can grow in the Christian faith is that we, wanna, we want to, to follow what is being said. And the Puritans sought to do that. Now, typically the Puritans' sermon structure, here's what it would be. They would start out with explaining the text, and they would explain just where the text is in its historical context. They would explain what the author is trying to say uh, when he says, when he writes that text. And then they would go on to their second point, and they would say, well, what is the doctrine of that text? Or sometimes we call it today, uh, what is the big idea of this text? And then their third point was actually the longest point. Their third point was the application. It was the, the so what. There's a story, a uh, famous story, and I, I'm not sure where exactly it came from or who exactly it was, but there's a story of a preaching professor in a seminary, and, 
And he would have this big sign that he would hold up every single time his students would preach a sermon. And when they would get about two thirds of the way through the sermon and they were, they were saying what this word meant and what that word meant and, and what God's word was saying and all these things, he'd hold up the sign in the back and it would just say in big, bold letters, it said, so what? That is what the Puritans would seek to answer in every single one of their sermons. So what? Here's what the Bible says. So what does it mean for me? And actually, the Puritans, uh, maybe typically the longest portion of any of their sermons was the application. Isn't that crazy to think about? We typically don't think about the Puritans in that way. But the longest part of their sermons was actually the application. What they would do is that they would present this majestic, incredible, clear, simple doctrine that that was amazing and yet they would apply it. And there's no generation that's done it better than them. You see, here's one thing I think we need to realize today, is that today we hear a lot of people in the evangelical world who are thinking so much on, we just need to give them the practical, we just need to give them the application, but yet we don't need to give them any doctrine. We don't need doctrine. People don't read doctrine. They don't know doctrine. We just need to give them application. Here's where that goes wrong. There is no such thing as proper application if there is not proper explanation. Do you hear that? There's no such thing as proper application of God's word if there is not first proper explanation of God's word. We don't need less theology today. We need more theology today. Once again, one of the reasons why the church today has caved in on so many areas is not because we study too much theology, but because we don't know enough theology. One of the reasons why, why, why Christians just, it, are, we seem to lack in holiness on the whole is that not because we don't study enough theology, but because we don't study, not because we don't study the, or that we don't need theology, but because we need more. You see, the Puritans, they knew theology was important but they knew theology was not meant to stay in the head. They would seek to go from head to heart. They knew that, that the truth must enter into your head first, but they knew it must go to your heart. That's what we need today. It is, listen, it is not good preaching if the preacher gets up there and just shows off how much he knows. It is not good preaching if the preacher gets up there and he only explains how the, 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 the people who had the letter of Galatians written to them, if he only explained their world and how they understood it, what we need today is good theology that is applied to us today. James Durham, the Puritan, he says this, application is the life of preaching. There is no less study, no less skill, wisdom, authority, or and plainness in the applying of a point to the conscience of hearers, and then pressing it home than is required in the opening of some profound truth. And therefore, some ministers should study the one as well as the other. Hence, preaching is called persuading, testifying, beseeching, entreating, or requesting, exhorting, all which import some such dealing in application. Long quote, what's he saying? He's saying this. We should work equally hard on not only explaining the text, but applying the text. Because here's the thing. There are people out there like you and me who are struggling so hard with sin, who are struggling so hard with what's going on in the culture around us, who are struggling so hard with with mental and emotional turmoil, who have difficult things happening at work, difficult things happening in school and in our families, And we don't want to just hear someone just ramble about how much they know about theology. We are asking the question, so what? How does this give me hope? How can I, how can I face tomorrow? How does this truth help me face tomorrow? And that's what the Puritans sought to do. They were, they wanted to apply the preaching, but they also wanted to affect with the preaching. Now, when I say affect, I mean like with, the, the letter A, affect, uh, the affections. Um, Puritans, even though there was this Puritan stereotype is that they were zero fun, sir, you remember from 
Um, remember the Titans, uh, zero fun, sir. They weren't, they weren't that. Um, they weren't dull, dry, lifeless. Um, matter of fact, they were probably more lively preachers than, than, than many today. Um, they would use many illustrations uh, so that people would, they wouldn't just like, picture it this way. The sermon is almost as if you take a pencil and you, and you draw this elaborate, incredible drawing, but it's only in uh, the graphite. It's, all, it's a black and white drawing. The illustrations come through and it puts all the different right colors in its places so that it becomes more clear. And the sermons, I mean, the Puritans sought to, to bring a lot of illustrations in their sermons so that the people would see more clearly what the truth is. They wanted to affect them with the truth. You see, the Puritans, they wanted people to be joyful over the text. They, even, they wanted people to be sad over what they needed to be sad about, to be compassionate, to have hope, to have encouragement based on what the truth was. It wasn't as if the Puritans would not preach just in this dry way and they would just only read it and preach in a monotone, boring way. And they would get mad at their people if they were not listening to them or if they were not paying attention. No, they wouldn't do that. They felt the truth. It, it's, it's, imp it's impossible to get up into the pulpit and to preach about the most incredible person ever and not be stirred up. Now, that happens in each person's different personality, to be sure. But the Puritans always sought to, to bring the affections in their preaching. You know, imagine this. R Richard Baxter says this. It's only here and there, or even among good ministers, that we find one who has an earnest, persuasive, powerful way of speaking, that the people can feel him when they hear him. You hear what he's saying? He's saying that what good preaching is and what we need more of is whenever people preach and speak in a way that's earnest, persuasive, and powerful so that the people feel him. I know that's what I need whenever I'm, whenever I'm sitting in the pew. I, I want to feel the truth. I don't just want to just hear it or feel like I'm just making it through a, a sermon. Uh, imagine, imagine if you see someone who's about to eat something poisonous. Would you be like really calm and just sit there and just say, uh, hey, that's not really good. Here's the science behind that. And uh, I don't think you should do that. That would... That wouldn't be helpful at all. What, what if you saw someone just laying down, tied up, and they're on the train tracks, and a train was coming, and you just said, um, hey, you should probably move because there's a train coming. Uh, you know, or, or, even, or even think about this, of another type of example. What if someone was about to taste one of the best dishes in the world, and the waiter brings the dish, and he says, yeah, um, it's all right. Um, and uh, I think you should just taste it and just kind of see for yourself you just take it or leave it all oh, those would be terrible how much more so whenever we are in every single sermon what we're hearing from the preacher is that life or death is at stake what we're hearing from the preacher is that jesus christ is the most beautiful person that he has the most wonderful gospel that could be ever be imagined and yet to think that we could just hear it and just say yeah that's nice and that is it says more about the state of our hearts uh, than it does anything. The Puritans were, they, they wanted to always be affect, affectionate in their preaching, and they wanted the people to feel what they were preaching. You see, this is why we must always be evangelistic in our sermons. We should always long for the pastor to be not only explaining the explicit gospel, but to also be calling people to come to Christ. If, you leave out, if we leave out anything in our sermons, we should never leave out what the gospel actually is. Not just saying the gospel, not just assuming the gospel, but explaining and saying what the good news really is and also calling people to come to Jesus. We, we can, look, there have been many times, I, have, I remember one sermon that I preached and it was, I'm not gonna lie, just in a speaking way, it was terrible really bad. I stumbled over all my words. I was not making any sense. People were just looking at me like, yeah, no. And matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it was to y'all. So I apologize. But there was one thing that I knew that I just, what had, what had been graciously, what had been taught to me from others. 
never leave out the gospel. Never leave out calling people to come to Jesus. That should be actually the standard that we should hold for in the pews for the pulpit. You see, this type of preaching, this Puritan preaching, they were filled with the Spirit. There, there's really there's no such thing as preaching without the Spirit. The Spirit was to be depended on. He was to be sought after. Um, one of my seminary professors, Elias Madera, said uh, he would tell us all the time, in my, like, as he was teaching or as he was preaching, he would often say, am I, am I boring you? Which he never was because he was very passionate. But he would say, am I boring you? Am, am I not preaching well right now? If I, if I am, pray for me. Pray that I might have the Spirit. Here's, here's how that affects us. If we feel like the preacher is boring, which we often, we often can be, if we feel like the preacher is, is boring or he's not doing well, don't just give up on him. Pray for him. Pray that the Spirit would come. We should, we should always be praying that the Holy Spirit would empower that preacher. Because if we understood an ounce of what Spirit-empowered preaching does to the Christian, then we would seek that as the most important thing of our week each week. I, I, I'm sure you've sat under people like this. I know the, there have been a couple of times where you know when the Spirit is empowering someone to preach and the gospel never seems more beautiful. Sin never seems more horrible. The cross just, the cross is just absolutely stunning. God is so big. You feel like that no matter what happens to you in the world, God is with you and that's all you need. That's why we need spirit. That's how it happens in spirit empowered preaching. That's why we, we need spirit empowered preaching. If, if we, if we had an ounce of understanding of what spirit-empowered preaching does to us, then we would resurrect the midweek prayer meeting, and we would show up anticipating the sermon, and we would pray after the sermon that God would continue to use it. Lastly, the Puritan sermons, they were Christ-centered. As I said earlier, the, the Puritan sermons, they didn't merely assume Jesus. They didn't merely just mention Jesus. They didn't really just kind of throw around his name. They would actually explain and apply and show Christ. If you read such sermons by John Flavel, Thomas Goodwin, you've never seen a better Jesus. He is absolutely stunning in those sermons. That's what good preaching is. A good preaching, what we need is to see Christ. We don't need less Jesus. We need more Jesus. And for the Puritans, this was the most important part because they realized that their people need Jesus. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan who we did a lesson on earlier in this uh, Sunday school, Thomas Goodwin says, if you would ever do any good, now think about that. As a preacher or as a pastor, if you would think, what's the one good thing, what's the most important good thing that he could do? Here's how Thomas Goodwin finishes that quote. If you would ever do any good, you must preach the gospel of free grace of God in Christ Jesus. That's the only good that we can do. That's, that's the good that we want our, our preachers, our pastors to do week in, week out, is to preach the free grace of God in Christ. You see, Jesus is so rich that he can handle being the main diet week in and week out. And that's what we need. That's what we need as Christians. We grow in that. So as the, as the preaching professor once held up the sign and said, so what? What does that mean for us in the Christian life? For one, we need to realize what the sermon is. Because when we realize what the sermon is, we realize, it's, actually, it's actually awesome. Because we realize that God is so eager to speak to us. We realize that God is so, he's so eager and so loving that he wants to cause everything else to go to the background so that we can see his grace. We don't need to settle for less. And all, often we settle for less in preaching. Or often we, we complain about preaching because we don't understand what the sermon is. And, and, and that's just not saying not only does the pew need to understand what the sermon is, but the pulpit needs to understand what the sermon is. It also means this. We need to pray. Pray for better preaching. And that's not like, that's not saying preaching today is terrible. That's not saying that. We can always be better. 
we should strive to be better. We, out of love for you, we should strive to have better preaching. So, so pray for better preaching. It will only grow your faith. It will only grow your knowledge of God's love for you. Here's the third thing. Listen to good preachers in person. One of the, one of the best experiences I had in college was uh, ran, literally we decided like it, it was one of those classic spur of the moment trips that college students can have. And, and uh, me and my roommates, it was me and three other guys from Troy, we decided randomly to drive down to Mobile, Alabama to go and listen to Stephen Lawson, uh, who was a pastor down in Mobile. And I remember we all, that, was the, that was the whole point of the trip. We just wanted to go down here and preach. And so we went down there and, and we heard him preach. And I remember just being, I still remember just where I was sitting. And I can't remember exactly what he was preaching, but I remember what I felt. That God was just so magnificent and so amazing. There, there was just, there was something. And I listened to him on, on YouTube and on podcasts a lot. But there's nothing like hearing good preaching in person. That's, just, that's the reason why we want to send our kids to go and listen and to, when they go to college to listen to Les Newsom, to listen to Seth Starkey and, you know, to get, to go to, to go to, to go to college Hill, to, to go to um, Trinity Prez in, in Tuscaloosa or wherever our, our college kids are. Um, we want them to go hear good preaching because it grows our faith. Fourthly, pray for better listening. Pray that we would, we would learn how to listen more uh, eagerly. Some people say, well, it's our attention span and all this. I, I don't really believe that because we can watch a two and a half, almost a three hour movie and be gripped by it. But yet what we need to pray for is better listening so that we can cherish the most important thing in the week. Pray for the spirit to empower the preaching and the hearing, not just the preaching. We need, we need, we need unction in the pew. I, I need, I need unction whenever I'm listening to a sermon so that the Holy spirit might drive it into my heart. Do things like this, do practical things like maybe taking notes is good for you. Maybe, maybe taking notes in, in a note takers Bible in your, in your own notebook or a scrap of paper or whatever it is. Sometimes note taking can really grow people's faith. Other times for other people, they just need to not do note-taking and they just need to listen. Figure out what works for you. Seventhly, do this. Give helpful feedback to us. Because here's the thing. Your soul, my soul depends on it. We should raise the bar for preaching because our souls depend on it. Now, that doesn't mean just going on a sin hunt and only pointing out the bad. That, that'll just that'll discourage the preacher time after time. Find ways to encourage. Find ways to give good feedback. And when it's appropriate, in its timing, and how you do it, let us know how we can improve. And lastly, I would say this. Anticipate it. Anticipate the moment of preaching. Because it really is a moment. It's not a moment for the preacher. It's not even a moment just for even, even like the physical sermon itself. It's a moment for you to stand alone and hear the words of Jesus. That's why preaching is so, it's so important. And that's, why, that's what the Puritans realized. Sinclair Ferguson, in a uh, kind of more of a, a private conversation, uh, he was asked this. He was asked, how do you know if a church is healthy? How do you know if, if they're really growing? I was stunned to hear his answer. Here's what he said. They attend worship Sunday evening to hear the word preached again. His, his point was saying is that, we know that we're growing in Christ, the, actually, the more we want to hear the word preached. Because it's not about the preacher. And we need to hear that as preachers. It's not about us. It's about hearing Jesus. Because the ministry of preaching is not the preacher's ministry. It is the ministry of Jesus through that preacher. That's how we know we're growing in the Christian faith, because we want to hear the lover of our souls.